The conference has been unmuted. Good morning, everybody. This is Mary Jenkins from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Charles Baldwin. Good morning. Good afternoon. And we are going to be in a conversation um, based on a title we came up with called Invisible Barriers, which will really focus on how you approach uh, your audience and how you ensure or come up with a plan to ensure um, the greatest possible access to what you're doing um, and a ways to meet them where they are. So, good morning, Charles. Why, hi. Um, and I think that uh, calling this invisible barriers is, you know, this is a, uh, this slide presentation is, is broad and really talks about things in some big picture ways. Um, but when we think about the different barriers that we face, um, there are many, and not all of them are visible. So I think that it's important to remember that when we're talking about a variety of people, uh, that it isn't always going to just be identifiable. But um, I always like to start with the uh, Mass Cultural Council's real commitment to the type of work that we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, Mary, you've been with the council for quite some time. I feel rather new having been uh, just here for a little bit more than two years, but the council's commitment to be a steward of this kind of education, I think, is of critical importance. So invisible barriers and the goals of universal participation. The Universal Participation Initiative really wants to talk about access broadly so that we get beyond uh, uh, ramps and large bathrooms, even though that is a part of it. So I'd like to start in discussing really the idea, you know, the constructive identity is often something that is used to separate us. And when we think about ability, uh, the ADA is, uh, is a law and regulations that really address access for people with disabilities as a civil right, and that is great. But when we break that down and we think about impairment as a, a problem in body function, uh, if you're unable to do an activity uh, based on, uh, you know, you're unable to shop for yourself or reach things, uh, reach for things, um, and the idea of participation being difficult because of life situations. I always like to bring this up because to me it addresses that disability is not just a health problem. I think we have a propensity to want to think about it uh, from a health manner or from an academic perspective. Um, but if you look at the numbers, one in five Americans are a person with a disability. You know, that's 20%. Um, kids between the ages of 3 and 21, 13% are identified as a person with disability. And a lot of these disabilities are brain-based disabilities that may affect vision, motion, hearing, but it does stem from the brain. And the number that I think is really important uh, to think about is the aging population. 50% of adults 65 plus have disabilities and 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. And that is often a population that connects with institutions' donor base, their board and council members. But when we think about functional limitations, we want to remember that arthritis or back problems, respiratory diseases, cognitive development, I mean, these are all things that are not visible, which is really why we've titled this Invisible Disabilities, because we're really trying to get an idea of anticipation. We look at this screen and that international symbol of the stick figure in the wheelchair has come to embody all disabilities. And yet, um, 
It's so much broader than that. I mean, if you look at the, the numbers, just the sheer uh, difficulty getting up and down stairs or being able to do everyday tasks are huge. Uh, and people who are blind or have low vision, people who are deaf or have uh, low hearing, um, those people are not identified by this great stamp of the stick figure in the wheelchair. Um, so we want to remember that, again, disability, or as I like to think about, the spectrum of ability is broader than the easy identifier of someone who may use a mobility device. Briefly, people with disabilities, and again, that's everybody. I'm wearing glasses today. I broke my wrist in August, so I've got a, you know, a, a bum wrist. Uh, people with disabilities are all ages, are, have work, have jobs, have lives, have families. But I think the key thing on this slide that I want to remember and have people uh, who are listening in remember is that people with disabilities don't always identify as a person with a disability. And that, I think, is critical. And then one last notion on that is the idea of if we remove the construct of identity and rather than labeling the person with a disability, but think of the environment as disabling, then really what we have is from toddler to elder, ability on a spectrum, and the idea that uh, this ability or these different abilities, these varying abilities outside of identity, but human functional limitations are actually quite very regular and we all experience them. So this is really why we're talking about how do we engage institutionally and regionally to provide certain enhancements, uh, intentional anticipation, um, because really we're all on this spectrum. Uh, the ADA Act was uh, passed 27 years ago with some revisions in 2010. Uh, this is a civil rights act, and it really is there to prevent discrimination and to provide equal opportunity, and that is in public accommodations, employment, transportation, state and local services, as well as te telecommunications. So, again, this is a civil rights act. Um, but I'd like to sort of, uh, for our purposes and for the listeners and for our discussion, Mary, I'd like to sort of call it down into three sort of action steps. Um, I'm not the ADA police. I'm not a legal scholar. I am an enthusiastic participant in wanting to engage the full spectrum of our humanity and our citizens. Um, so I call it down to three things. Integrated programs. There are, the goal is to bring people together and create power in our plurality. Uh, reasonable accommodations. Uh, sometimes people get kind of uh, stuck on all the technological enhancements. Those are great. Um, and we'll discuss this. Reasonable is contextual. So uh, don't just hide behind that. Um, and the part that, uh, that resonates with me is the phrase effective communication. Um, because I think that is something that <laughs> really we want in our everyday lives to begin with. Um, so that it's a, those are broad phrases that can really mean a lot. And those are the three action steps I always like to bring down to the ADA. Um, we'll just briefly look at this picture by Tom Olin because I like to remind ourselves that uh, in 1990, and again in some of the healthcare protests, people with disabilities are putting themselves on the front line. This is activism activated. So, and these are great pictures by Tom Olin if you want to look them up. But let's get started. I think the most important way to begin is to really, what I call authentic assessment, really look at where you are as an institution, within a neighborhood. You know, the people who are listening in may be working for institutions, but they may be wanting to help organizations. Uh, they may be wanting to create an event with an individual who is sparked with an idea. So it really requires looking authentically at the environment in a manner that is candid. You know, uh, this isn't to you know give pluses and minuses, but it really is to be honest. Um, what you have, what you need. 
Uh, I do think that you want to coordinate with institutions. That is uh, the whole idea of not having to do it alone. Marketing and communications talks to the idea of effective communication. Uh, indoors and outdoors have their own sort of uh, specific <laughs> uh, uh, intrinsic values. So uh, looking a little bit at that. Um, risk management is, you know, it's a, it's a big topic. We could spend all day on risk management, but I do want to highlight a few things. Um, and then the idea of responding to requests, because so often when people come into this idea of how do we really engage and embrace and invite the full variety of people into our event, into our building, into our institution, uh, sometimes people uh, do this out of either I have a connection, a personal connection, uh, based on my family, my own lived experience, um, but sometimes higher ups do it for fear of litigation. <laughs> so we want to help them with that. But the the thing we want to always emphasize is make that first step, get beyond, oh, it's good enough, and really keep moving incrementally. Get it right. Planning. So. Um, so within assessment and policy development, uh, the phrase user expert is used to identify people with functional limitations and really centering their voice. So with the UP initiative uh, that we have here at the Mass Cultural Council, we work with the Institute for Human Centered Design, their user expert lab. And that is a uh, opportunity, again, to center the voice of someone who, uh, by their sheer lived experience, experience understands barriers. Um, and that could be a person who identifies as a person as a disability. Uh, it could be an older person who doesn't get around as well. It could be a kid who doesn't get around the same way uh, an adult does. But it really is thinking about, uh, rather than imagining how something might work, uh, let's bring in cohorts who can actually experience it. Um, Institutional buy-in, you know, this is, you've got your legal ground, but you also really want to think about how does an organization implement a project? Um, that's many moving parts, and um, recognizing what's been done and how you can build on that. And I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, as you bring your people and your group and your cohorts together, make sure everyone's on the same page, they know what their role is, um, the reason that you're doing this, and we'll talk a little bit about language when we talk about hospitality, but as I always like to say, um, plan to uh, spend time before you spend money. So it's all about planning. And when we think about the built environment, because I know many of uh, people who may be listening in and the kind of work that you do out in the districts, Mary, is that um, it's, uh, you know, it's built environments and all the spaces in between so that you really want to think of place as a sequence. So uh, when I work with institutions, they may say, well, I can't control the MBTA, but you want to be aware that to get to a place, that, that getting to and leaving from, that information is just as important. So, um, and that uh, all the different uh, surfaces and grades and sidewalks and crosswalks, I mean, it, it may not be your distinct role, but the understanding of getting in and out that transition, I think, is important. Uh, when I think about coordinating institutions, some of that is, um, you know, we're, we're putting on an event, so we've got the musical group and then the, the venue, but sometimes it really is wanting to, again, really connect with people. So in this case, you know, we talk about uh, staff training, getting everyone on the same page. And human resources are often the most affordable things that you can do. And attitude makes a huge difference. You know, things can go, it's customer service. Things can be difficult, but if you have a great customer service experience, that makes all the difference. And I use the phrase radical hospitality because um, I have learned that uh, over time, having done this a long time, uh, some people are better at it than others. 
<laughs> and I think that's okay, but you want to identify who those people are who can lead and can be your uh, you know, front house crew. Uh, again, spend time before money. This is where you get into attitude, always really important. Um, and think about partnering, you know, when we were talking about the user expert and centering marginalized voices, think about partnering with councils on aging or the Office of Disabilities. Uh, you may have independent living centers, senior centers, uh, social service agencies. These are ways to really, again, center, uh, center voices that are not always listened to and often overlooked, but can really provide some insight. And we can't stress enough effective communication. Um, we know that the first point of contact for most people is the website. And you know, gone are the days where you might wander on by first. Um, people check out websites. They check out websites on their computers, their phones, their tablets. Um, so making sure that your website, there's, there's no specific regulations, but uh, the, there are, are obligations, I believe, and suggestions. Um, if you look up WCAG 2.0, which I have to say is web content, act, anyway, I have to say, I, I don't have the exact words for the acronym, but they're going to give you a lot of suggestions which in the graphic to the right of the slide really talks about some of the bigger pictures on making digital and web access. It's robust, it's perceivable, it's operable, it's understandable. I mean, this comes down into intuitive. I mean, I don't know how many times. We were doing it today as we were getting set up for this web platform. It wasn't necessarily intuitive as we were trying to figure out how to make this, uh, this system sort of go. Um, but that's what you want from the websites, and whether that's a, a city website, an institution website, uh, a website that is emerging, um, to be aware of not only do you want it to be operable and intuitive, but you want to make sure that images, uh, if, if, if I was using a screen reader, alt text provides a description of the image so it doesn't just read image. Meta tags are going to help you rise up in your searches. Uh, captions for videos are, are I think, vitally important. Uh, YouTube does this uh, based on an audio file, but um, there are free caption software out there, um, actually located in the greater Boston area. Um, and to be thinking about multiple languages. Um, Often when people think about access and they start thinking about people with disabilities, they're immediately going to American Sign Language and our, our followers and fans who are, are, are deaf. And ASL, of course, is a language. Once you start thinking about ASL, what are the other languages that are spoken by some of your patrons? So, and um, indoors and outdoors. And I think we've had, we could have a, a full discussion on mapping and wayfinding, particularly when you're thinking about how do you move someone to a place that ties into that whole idea of place as sequence, getting there and leaving. Uh, mapping and wayfinding is a critical part of informing patronage. And we also want to remember that uh, beyond patronage, the, the artist, the performer, the, the, the work that you're highlighting, um, we want to make sure that we include the presenter as well. Um, so when you're thinking about uh, place, do you think about how you get there and how you leave? Um, and within sort of the invisible barriers, you know, you can identify someone who uh, uses a wheelchair because they're in a mobility device. But with the rise of neural differences in young people and brain-based uh, and cognitive development differences, uh, these, are, these put the spectrum of ability uh, in a vast range. And we know that for every person who likes the wide open spaces, you've also got people who want to have um, secluded and private spots. 
And I think when you look at this list where it's, you know, transitions and thresholds and signage and is two key things to remember. One size does not fit all. And the goal is to try to embrace the widest amount of our population and recognizing that there will be some specifics that individual needs. So don't get stuck on this is the answer that will solve every access issue. So one size does not fit all. And I think that if you really think about a multi-sensory, multi-modal approach to how you share information, and how you communicate with potential patrons, how you look at the environment that you are either building or identifying, if you look at that in a multi-sensory way, then that really can help you build the platform for what we're talking about. Um, so you've got your five senses, you know, the, the, the physical, the tactile for touch, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can hear. Um, being the guy that I am, I do like to add the sixth sense of intuition. And <laughs> I do like this picture of the man flipping on the banana peel because uh, a couple of things. Certainly uh, trauma uh, for as we're thinking about, uh, again, human functional limitations and how we experience that, trauma and a temporary functional limitation is everywhere. So that's something uh, that we are all part of. I think I mentioned my broken wrist in August and the reading glasses I'm wearing because I'm getting older. These are two methods of, of sort of defining a functional limitation. But in the, the bigger picture, when we're thinking about Again, institutions and venues, even outdoor environments, is that idea of emergency planning. People who can't move as well, need, you don't want to forget them. People who can't hear an audio alarm, that's why we have the lights flashing. Um, you want to just be reminded that how you signal an emergency is critical. But you really do want to connect up with um, cross departments. There are more private institutions helping with this. Originally, we would say, you know, go to the police station, go to the fire station. Um, they're getting busy, uh, but there are private groups that will really address emergency planning, um, what that means, identifying places of egress, identifying places to assemble. Um, within that, uh, those are big emergencies, but even just on a smaller scale indoors, lighting and acoustics. You want to be able to see your path of travel. And for any of us who have been in a loud room, uh, acoustics really become an issue that can send someone in or out of a space. When you're outdoors, of course, it's identifying where's shade, where's their food or water. Um, restrooms, you know, I, I said that access isn't all about restrooms and ramps, but it does include restrooms and ramps. And then, of course, the newest thing, uh, which we all need to be aware of, is power stations. Uh, you know, many of us have our, our phones, you know, hooked onto our hip and need to power them up. But for other folks who might be using electronic devices to help them communicate, help them be mobile, um, remind them about medication, uh, power is becoming integral to just, you know, getting through the day. Um, and then... Uh, Allergies are covered by the ADA, so being aware of allergens. You know, you see more and more of allergens discussed in food if you, if you have an allergy to something, alert your server. Well, uh, in an outdoor environment, you just want to be aware of your plantings, uh, particularly with the idea of um, kids with neurological differences uh, sometimes put everything in their mouths. So you might not want to have rhubarb leaves which are poisonous, uh, growing everywhere. Um, so just things to be aware of. And this really ties into that idea of the authentic assessment, big picture, and looking at some of the details. And all of this is really to inspire you, listeners, us, to have a plan. Because as I said at the beginning, what might drive a person to participate in thinking about access, which 
again, often comes from a place, either your own connection based on your own lived experience or a loved one or a friend. Um, a lot of this sometimes comes from fear of litigation. Um, but you want to have a plan in place. And even if you're moving along incrementally, this plan allows you to, uh, to be involved. So rather than, I hear sometimes from organizations, we're waiting to get started as soon as we get to, whatever that might be. And it's often like people want to be at the perfect spot before they start. And the, the push and the belief is to start now. Because if you start with this authentic assessment, you think about a plan with short-term and long-term goals, you remain nimble because everything changes. We've identified that one size does not fit all. If there should be a grievance against you, you now have a plan in place. You've got people identified who can be the point person because no one wants to just have to make, you know, call nobody. If you uh, are on the website and you have something you want to say, you want to talk to a person. But you've got a plan in place. People have their roles. It's a multi-departmental approach. It doesn't just fall to one person to solve things. And like any hospitality issue, um, fixing a problem involves listening and adaptability. So baby steps regularly and often, but start now. That's it. Uh, briefly, uh, because a lot of, you know, the phone, our personal handheld devices, do have a lot of things that make things more accessible. You can make your font larger, you can turn on an audio, you can turn off the audio, but sometimes it can just be simpler. So I like to provide a brief list of auxiliary aids that are not as complicated as you might think. And this fits into sort of staff training, attitude adjustment, being very affordable, and often, you know, your front line is really where you want to start. So some of it is descriptive language. If you are sending out information to a potential patron about how to get there, not everyone responds to 3.2 miles, but they might respond to the old church on the corner, the large oak tree. <laughs> so you want to remember descriptive language. Um, great to have technical resources. Uh, some of them uh, are provided and can be gotten from some of the state agencies. Easter Seals is great. They have an adaptive technology library. Um, you do want to be aware of service animals. Uh, the ADA covers service animals not emotional support animals, but particularly if we're talking about um, institutions and again, sort of like a cultural district, uh, you want to be aware of dogs and other pets because um, that uh, people have dogs. So how do you, uh, are you prepared for them? You know, a policy to empower your frontline staff to have answers on emotional support animals or just a general pet is important. Do remember though that service animals can go anywhere. Uh, mobility devices, wheels, wheels, wheels. So you know the that, that icon that we showed at the beginning with the stick figure in the in the wheel device. Um, that wheelchair is not as common as you may think. People have uh, the technology has advanced. Um, different chairs for different needs. Some are quite large, but devices are not limited to the quote unquote traditional wheelchair. Segways could be covered by mobility devices for someone who couldn't sit down. Uh, I'm sure we've seen people with a broken leg or on like that one-legged scooter. Um, so, uh, and we also know, and, and for those of us who work in this movement, we think about how the ramps were really put in because people with disabilities were demanding access. And yet now we all use the ramp with our bicycles, uh, with strollers, uh, the delivery person with packages. So the idea is, you know, you design for the margins and everyone will be able to take advantage of that. So uh, do think about wheels. Uh, assistive listening systems, if you offer amplified sound, you do want to make sure that you have the opportunity uh, to enhance that sound. Um, 
Large print programs are – large print is a great way to help someone with visual impairment. Um, think about that multimodal approach as a method for communication. And uh, always remember your human resources. Uh, we're experiencing a technical dis difficulty with um, forwarding the slides at the moment, and uh, we may well exit the program and come back to you, but we'll continue talking. Oh, I'll get, certainly. Uh, your connection has been reestablished. Excellent. Okay, here we go. We're back in. So we're going to sort of go through the next couple of slides fairly quickly, um, because I really do want to hear questions from... Uh, our listeners, and I want Mary to jump in and tease out some of these things, but um, here at the Mass Cultural Council, we use the uh, principles of universal design to really help us understand uh, and anticipate uh, the great variety of humans. And although this is cultural competency work through the lens of ability, uh, we really think that all of this work falls under diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do we embrace the widest possible uh, selection of our humanity and not leave anybody out. Um, universal design has seven principles, equitable, equitable, flexible, simple and intuitive, see there's my sixth sense there, to intuition, perceptible, tolerance for error, this is hard because so many organizations are afraid of making mistakes. And this is where I often hear, you know, we're about to start as soon as we are in that right place. But it's okay to make mistakes if you learn from them and build upon that. Uh, low physical effort. Um, you know, one of those things why you have doors that open easily, it's not just for someone who might be using a chair to push open, um, but for those of us who don't have a lot of strength in our arms, so low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use. And again, that affects many of us. So I think I have um, the idea of having a, a couple of things to inspire us, to get us thinking sort of more broadly. And I have a couple of slides here that will, I hope, inspire us. We'll see if they come up, or else I'm just going to keep on chatting. So, again, the goals of the ADA, I believe, we'll again, reiterate this for emphasis, integrated settings, I think that's really important. Um, we know there are times where populations want something that is distinctly theirs. Sometimes that's based on language. If everyone speaks Spanish, it's great to have a Spanish program. Um, but this also could connect to uh, families with children or adults along the spectrum. Sometimes based on behaviors and noises, people feel uh, better to be in their own sort of group, feel safer. Um, but the goal, the bigger goal, I think, is integration. Uh, we did sort of touch upon the idea of effective communication. I hear sometimes organizations, people in organizations will say to me, we provided ASL interpreting, but nobody came. Well, I would say then that your communications department maybe wasn't effectively communicating that you have this. So when we're thinking about communication, it's really a two-way street. How are you communicating with your organization, and how are you communicating with your regular patrons, and how are you communicating with patrons that you would love to come into your institutions? You know, we here at the Mass Cultural Council are primarily working with nonprofit institutions, and nonprofit institutions are really here to serve and serve the public. Um, and then I think my last little story is about reasonable accommodations, because as I said, I, we want you to keep moving, baby steps, incremental to get it right. And the desire and the legal requirement for reasonable accommodations is contextual. Uh, obviously, small budget organization may not have the ability to uh, uh, hit, uh, you know, spend money, which is why you want to find affordable ways. That's where we get back into attitude. But uh, context, because large picture. 
if they are someone is complaining uh, about a reasonable accommodation not being made at a very large institution, uh, then it's harder to sort of fight that. Um, so what is reasonable is contextual. And I think that connects to my final slide about the eight goals of universal design. You know, we talk about the principles. Those are the, the heady, the heady uh, horizon. But when we think about the goals. Sometimes they're a little simpler. Body fit. You know, we all have different shaped bodies, and how do we, how are they accommodated? You know, we can certainly, uh, we know that the airlines and their tiny little seats are not necessarily thinking about universal design. They're thinking we're all very slim-hipped people and short-legged people, um, and that connects to comfort and awareness. Awareness is a great way to be thinking about staff training because that's really what it connects to. Understanding. If your staff is unaware of how a device works, that's a problem. Uh, you want staff to understand why you're doing it, connects to vision, but also understand some of the enhancements that we may be talking about. I like these, these, these goals. They, they come out of the University of Buffalo because I do think that wellness is something, you know, health promotion is something that we need to be aware of. And it connects to the outdoor environments because I know some of people listening in are not necessarily institutional people, but regional or district people. And the outdoors uh, connects, I think, intrinsically to well-being. Social integration, you know, this is the, the, the goal of integration versus separation, the, the power that we can get from our plurality. Uh, personalization, that's, you know, that's all connected to the device, but it also connects to, rather than Mary and I sitting here imagining, why don't we actually ask people what do they need? And then cultural appropriateness. And I think this connects sometimes to, uh, I think a good example is ASL, American Sign Language. People will often want to add uh, American Sign Language into a program. It's beautiful without necessarily recognizing it's a language. And it's not just beautiful. I mean, many languages are beautiful. But um, it's a language and a culture. And you really, I think this connects to uh, sort of the ethos of the program and the movement, which is really about nothing about us without us. Because it isn't really so much of this work about creating a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of ownership, so that you uh, and new people coming into your institution feel deeply connected and engaged. So that nothing about us without us, I think, resonates as a, as a policy to always be striving for. The next couple of slides, oh, my silver right, another photo by Tom Oland, uh, which I love, 1990, uh, demanding access by getting out of their chairs. People were crawling up the Capitol steps. And think back to a year ago when people were being lifted out of their wheelchairs to try to protect health care rights. So again, people willing to go on the front line. And this is something I think for those of us working in cultural institutions, cultural districts, we want to honor. This is civil rights work. Lots of resources. I suggest, uh, you know, maybe Mary will send this out so people have access to it rather than having people have to scribble them all down. In New England and in Massachusetts, we have some wonderful organizations that can help. Uh, and of course, we here at the Mass Cultural Council and the Universal Participation Initiative are also here to help, which is really what's defining this webinar. So I'm hoping, we've got a lot of offices, the government has a lot of offices, um, but I'm hoping now that I've, I've said enough that might provoke some interesting questions either from people who are listening in or from Mary, who's been sitting here scribbling notes madly. So, um, so the thing that really struck me early on in, in your presentation was if you switch out thinking about people as being the the um, as being the sort of dis as being disabled, and you think about the environment as being the um, disabling then what's required is a human response 
to the environment so that it, I think it's sort of, for me, it helps take the lid off of how do I deal with all these people and this is overwhelming and I can't possibly do this for all of these you know, people with all of these needs. Whereas if I approach the sort of environment and think about, you know, in what ways my community or my cultural district um, has limitations, it allows you to sort of open up a conversation about about what that looks I think, like. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so, so I'm not talking to you, the executive director of an institution, saying you're at fault here. It's, it's really being able to say we have this environment that's a problem. How are we going to solve that? And I think that's, that's key. You know, when, uh, again, going back to the simple example of uh, the ramp, um, the idea is to create an environment that is welcoming and easy. We've sort of identified different goals and different principles. But rather than thinking, oh, the ramp is for this type of person, but rather the ramped entrance into my institution creates an easier more accessible environment, less identifying who needs it, and more just, again, looking at the environment and how can we make it easier, more accessible, relevant. Uh, and that, again, I think ties to the social environment as well as the information environment. So that's it right there, and environmental. The, the other thing that, that I... Um, that sometimes comes up as a sort of sensitive area. You mentioned um, finding user experts um, to help you do the kind of assessment that we're um, that we're talking about. And you said, you know, to approach uh, seniors, to approach school groups. How do you do that sensitively? So you're not sort of saying, mm, well, you're in a wheelchair, therefore I want you to kind of walk around with me. And, and help me figure well, that. How do you do that sensitively? Well, you want to be sensitive, but you also want to have a certain level of candor. Um, you know, you're asking people to consult based on expertise. So how would you approach any consultant that you think is an expert? You identify that you have an issue that you want experts to come and help you on. Now, optimally, you provide some sort of stipend or payment, because we also know that you know, people in the arts, people with disabilities are being asked to do things for free all the time. It could be a Dunkin' Donuts card. Well, not to give a shout out to them. But the idea is um, think of folks that you're approaching as expert consultants, and that's how you, you do it. I have an issue, and I'm looking for experts to help me. And people will rise to the occasion. Okay. And so I think um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to unmute everyone um, so that you can join in the conversation with us. The conference has been unmuted. And if you heard that recording, you're now unmuted. So if anybody has a question they want to put forward or an observation, or they want to talk about something they've done in their own community, then um, please feel free to um, comment at this time. So um, if nobody's going to add in anything, I'm, I'm really struck by this idea of radical hospitality. Well, and I wish it wasn't radical, right. but it is still often. And uh, part of this is that, uh, you know, for the last umpteen years, uh, organizations have been talking about engaging diverse audiences. And um, I think that when we're talking uh, about competency around the ADA, functional limitations, that there's a perception that, uh, that is sort of like a medical lens. Um, this comes out of a rehabilitative model. Um, I like to come at it from a hospitality lens. And that idea of radical hospitality is that everybody is welcome. So think about what are the ways and methods that you can uh, engage everybody. So as an, as an example, um, last night we were, uh, I was working with the uh, Institute of Human Centered Design. We were doing a site visit and they, uh, the venue that we were at had these, they were beautiful, 
but they were really large, really heavy doors. And some of us had difficulty getting through the door. Now, when we're talking about hospitality, if you can't even get through the front door, that's a problem. But uh, one of the things that came up after the site visit was the idea of if you know you have an event, um, have someone standing at the door to open it for everybody. So it becomes less about I need to open the door for this type of person and more I'm going to welcome everybody by opening the door for everybody, which shouldn't be a radical notion, but still is sometimes. At, I worked uh, at a theatre in Scotland uh, many years ago, and I was responsible for ha front of house operations. And one of the expectations of the front of house manager is they would greet everybody that came through the door, and they would say good night to everybody that left. And I think that what that showed me at that time, whether or not I was really, I wouldn't have said I was particularly aware of the effect that I was having, but um, over time you came to realize that it makes a difference to people to be welcomed um, in that way. And I think that that's, you know, we, we are, we're not as friendly as we think we are. <laughs> um, that's what strikes me. Um, we, um, oftentimes when people are visiting an institution, it can be for the first time. And I think we forget that. It can be the first, or they're bringing their children, or whatever it is they're doing. It's sort of being able to make that the optimal experience wherever you're coming from, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of, or of what your needs are. Well, and, and the human resources are key. So uh, in, in, the, in the environment of a theater, so in the environment of a theater, there's amplified sound. So uh, theaters are now required, places of assembly are required to have amplification devices so that if you are hard of hearing, there's a device that will amplify the sound. That's not an answer for everybody. Hearing is on a spectrum. But for people who want to amplify the sound, it's a great resource. Uh, often, these pieces of equipment maybe aren't understood by the staff or the volunteers who are helping. So radical hospitality would make sure that, A, everyone who was on the staff or volunteering that day knew what these devices were and how they worked. And what we always would suggest is carry AA batteries with you because you hand it out, you're busy, you know, you hand out the device, you're like, here you are, Mary, here's your amplification device, want to make sure it's all good, and then you run off to the do the next chore. I suddenly see you waving from the distance because you're like, I can't get this to work. Well, A, I want to know how the machine works so I can help you, and B, uh, maybe no one checked the batteries, and that could be it. So rather than making a separate trip, radical hospitality has me have two batteries in my pocket so I can replace them right there. That kind of exchange between a patron and a volunteer, a patron and employee, you're going to be psyched because now it's working, and it didn't require a lot of like, oh, I must go to the manager to find batteries. So it touches upon a lot of points, hospitality, patron services, empowerment of your staff or volunteer to know how the equipment works, um, and also, and this ties into saying hello, goodbye to people, um, going back to the patron that you were assisting to make sure everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, we, um, and I think that, that we, or we, many of us work with volunteers, or many of us are, um, attend events or are working with cultural organizations or other kinds of businesses um, within our district or within our community. And I think that this is a conversation that can be opened up um, about how, you know, how, how would you grade yourself um, in, terms of, in terms of your community? How informed are people um, in terms of the information they're exchanging? And how do you think about and have conversations about um, taking care of the people that have made the effort to turn out for the things that you are doing. Um, you know, safety is one of the other concerns that uh, uh, is a very real one. Well, and I, you know, this was a this was a, a broad overview to hopefully get people wanting to dive deeper. And I do think that uh, you know we could do a whole session on safety and risk management. Um, 
because sometimes safety is a symbol, again, using last night's site visit as an example, um, we were traveling with a woman who uses a service dog, and the property, uh, for whatever reason, didn't have any waste cans. No, that, uh, garbage cans. Uh, but we were traveling with an animal, a service animal that had access because she needed it. So sometimes as simple as a trash can becomes a safety issue. Um, the big picture, of course, is that uh, is about awareness uh, and is about, you know, no one wants anyone falling down the stairs. No one wants uh, a, a, a child, uh, you know, getting his or her hand in a door. Um, the resources that are developed uh, to create access for persons with disabilities do benefit a larger part of the population than you may be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that safety might often help leaders understand why this is important, uh, as is the fear of litigation, as it's a, it's a top to bottom buy-in. Because you want that, you want the leadership to buy in, but you need to empower and inform your volunteers and your frontline staff as well. Everyone really needs to be a part of it. So, um, to sort of follow on uh, on that, um, if, for instance, you've got a large outdoor event coming up, or um, you're going to have a, a large a number of events that will take people in and out of buildings, I think being able to understand where a potential crush is, and how you um, how you manage that is actually thinking really through what some of these um, invisible barriers are, and actually how potentially hazardous they can be. Thresholds, thresholds, and transitions. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are looking at uh, your volunteer base or your staff base, and you're like, where do we put people? Because we've got this large festival. Thresholds are where you want to have people to. That's where it'll get congested because it, uh, the path of travel is condensed either based on width of stairs, width of door, uh, width of ramp. Um, and you want to control point of entry at those constricted places. So, so things like being able to, ordinarily, if you're an institution that wouldn't have somebody in the elevator, yeah. but you know there's a major event and you're going to have a lot of people, um, what you don't want to do is allow too many into, people into that environment at any one time. So you might want to consider actually having an elevator, somebody literally in the elevator actually d dealing with the tra traffic flow. Um, in my experience, as long as people know what's going on, they don't mind. See, that's you know? it. It really is about that sort of mapping and wayfinding, that idea of informing people. Because right. you've got an outdoor festival and you're yeah. psyched that hundreds of people are coming. But it would be great to have a path of travel for people utilizing wheels. So that could be people with mobility devices, people with a child. That does restrict it to wheels, and it might mean someone is at the head of that saying, oh, this path is for. Um, but again, as long as people are informed, the person who's making these announcements or uh, you know, is friendly, that makes all the difference. People understand that. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the Crowds, um, whether you've got, whether you're typical, neurologically different, I mean, all of those things, crowds uh, have a potential for being difficult for a variety of people for a variety of reasons. So can you create paths of travel that are more open, um, which would then help other people? Or if you can't create a path of travel, can you create an environment, one tent, one area, that is for chill out? Many of us, anxiety, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to get out of the crowd. So to have a quiet room, a chill space, uh, include that in your street festival for people who need oh, that breathing space. Mm -hmm. Or literally somewhere to sit down or um, some, you know. Where's the shade? Where's the water? Where can right, you sit? Right. You know, and, and that's sort of like the reverse tech rider. If this is going to be the area of the festival along Main mm -hmm. Street, what are the, the uh, string points that we can connect where mm -hmm. people can get a breather, people can take a break? Because to uh, 
really dive into the crowd can be exciting, but to get out of it is sometimes a respite that is required. Um, so knowing that you want these two environments, be intentional about that when you're putting your street fair outdoor festival together. You know, um, I, it just struck me that one of the things that would be really easy to do um, for folks is to, the next time you have a, um, a meeting with your partners or you have a meeting, if you're a local cultural council member, you have a meeting with them or there's a staff meeting. Um, if people are willing to share the information, you could go around the room and sort of say, what are some of the impediments for you personally um, in being in a space? Or um, that could be because they bring children with them um, and they have the specific needs. That could be actually that there are limitations that you don't know anything about. Um, but it's a way of actually being able to open up a discussion. I mean, I think the first step we have to take is really build our own personal awareness of really what these limitations look like um, for the people that are around us. And to, to, in educating ourselves, it's a first step in understanding how we can change the environment we um, participate in on a day in, day, in, day out there. I think that totally ties into that, that vision of that authentic assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always easy to be vulnerable, but the idea of placing yourself in the world of what your limitations are, um, that is a great way to get started. And if you can get a collection of people who are willing to be honest and authentic and then travel through the environment to really see what works, what doesn't, what you might need. Again, we know that not one all, one size doesn't fit all, but how wonderful to start recognizing the different perceptions of an environment and what those that variety of limitations might be. So it really then it does help you intentionally design for inclusion. I think that's a great way to bring this condo to a close. Um, I want to emphasize again that what we're aiming for here is the optimal experience for the people who attend your events wherever they are, um, in whatever way they are, in whatever environment, um, in a way that's safe and caring and as easy for them as they possibly can be. So um, I will be sharing uh, the resources that uh, Charles has listed here um, with everybody who's participated. We have recorded this convo. And I'd like to think that you use this um, as a, a way of being able to kickstart a conversation uh, amongst the people that you are uh, currently working with. Um, please let me know after the fact if you have any questions. And I want you to know that Charles is very willing to be a resource. He also comes into communities and he'll do sort of workshops on the ground. If you think that's something you want to do, please be in contact with me or with Charles. He's on the staff listing um, at, on the Mass Cultural Council website. So um, I want to thank you for joining us this morning and um, watch for the next Convo, convo Blast. Thank you very much. <laughs> really thank, glad thank you, to be here. Thank you. Thank you.